the end of March 2020, during the first wave of the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic, we told you in a video here on Visual Politic that mistakes that Spain had made had caused it to become the worst epicenter of the pandemic. Well, six months later, things kind of seem to be back to square one. And you will soon see that, compared to the rest of Europe, the data from Spain is very, very bad. At the time of making this video, Spain was accumulating more than 10,000 new positive cases every day. In total, the number of confirmed cases since the beginning of the pandemic is now well over 8 hundred thousand. Since mid-July, and after one of the strictest quarantines in the world, Spain has seen its numbers skyrocket again. And it's not just the positive cases. The number of deaths have been growing steadily since August as well. Yes, the numbers are very different from those of March and April, but with between 100 and 200 deaths every day, Spain has already amassed around 50,000 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. A figure that, in relation to its population, is the highest rate in the world, behind only the European microstate of San Marino. No matter what data we look at, on a European level, Spain is by far the country that has worst managed the first wave and is also the country that is doing the worst job managing the second wave. Listen up. Spain once again grapples with Europe's worst infection rate, the Telegraph. And actually, they win the prize not only in Europe, but in the whole developed world. Because the truth is that, despite what many Spanish politicians are saying in attempts to exculpate themselves, those dire statistics are not something that is happening all over the world, not even anywhere else in Europe. Certainly not to the same extent. <laughs> Without digging too deeply, there is the case of Italy, a country that is very socially and culturally similar to Spain, and which, as you all know, during the months of February and March of 2020, was one of the first epicenters of the pandemic in the world. Well, to give you a comparison, at the time of making this video, the spread of the virus in Italy was only 46.5 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in 14 days. In Spain, the spread of the virus has increased to 302.4 cases, 6.5 times more than that of Italy. Take a look at this map you see on the screen. As you can see, only the Czech Republic, where I live, the Netherlands and France have figures that are similar to Spanish levels. And to say that they're close is a bit of an exaggeration because the spread rates registered in these countries are still much lower than Spain's. Something does not add up here, does it? And what on earth has Spain done to find themselves with such figures in October? Whose fault is it? And more importantly, what could have been done to avoid this situation that makes Spain once again trailing the pack of all the other countries of Europe. Are you ready to investigate? If you are, let's get cracking. Hemos derrotado al virus y controlado la pandemia y doblegado la curva. Yo creo que Sánchez Ayuso es una gran presidenta y para mí es eh, la alternativa, el ejemplo de lo que nosotros queríamos hacer a nivel nacional. Spain from bad to worse. My visual Paul amigos, we're talking about Spain, you see what I did there? As you can imagine, in order to reach the dubious title of the worst Western country in terms of the coronavirus by September, the Spanish must have done something very, very wrong. Something that, in Spain's case, began as far back as May and June 2020, during the so-called de-escalation of quarantine measures. The de-escalation was a process of several weeks that served as a transition between the total confinement of the population that took place between March and May and the return to normality through three phases with gradually fewer restrictions. We are talking about a critical process that, if not handled correctly, carries a risk that the situation will soon get out of control again. And that is exactly what happened. The government of Pedro Sanchez, which took control of the process during the quarantine by declaring a state of alarm, which included commandeering some of the powers that regional governments usually have, failed miserably to prepare the country for the return to the new normal. Such a transition should have included lots and lots and lots of tests and many, many tracers to control outbreaks and to keep what is known as community transmission to an absolute minimum. El horizonte y el perímetro, por lo tanto, está auditado, está planificado. El gobierno de España tiene el horizonte y la estrategia clara. Now, wait a minute, because the central government of Spain was by no means the only one who got it terribly wrong, right? The autonomous communities, which in Spain are a bit like state governments, have power over public health and are responsible for managing the health system in their regions. And they have not been exactly up to the task, at least 
Not many of them have. For example, in regions such as Madrid, Aragon and Catalonia, autonomous governments were unable to set up tracing teams to promptly detect positive cases and test their environments in order to prevent further spread. Something which has proven to be indispensable in the fight against the coronavirus. Alarm for the insufficient tracers and monitoring of cases. The experts in this task of surveying the positive cases to assess whether their contacts are social, family, or workmates and start their monitoring do not reach 200 throughout Catalonia, La Vanguardia. July 15th, 2020, Madrid and Catalonia have 15% of the tracers that are needed, El Economista. To give you some idea, do you know how many tracers were needed in Madrid and Catalonia? That is the minimum number to control the virus after confinement. Well, between 2,000 and 3,000. That's a low estimate and calculated for an environment where the pandemic was under control, of course. Well, in July, there weren't even 200. And at the time of making this video, in Madrid, for example, there were only about 800 active tracers. 800 tracers that in practice seem to be stuck simply on the phone. And it's not that lack of resources is a problem for these governments. The autonomous governments of Madrid and Catalonia manage annual budgets of more than 20 and 30 billion euros respectively. But in order to get a more detailed view of what has happened, let's focus for a moment on the case of Madrid. Están aprovechando la mayor crisis que ha vivido la historia reciente de España para imponer un mando uno único dictatorial. Es absolutamente imposible acabar con una epidemia de estas características solo desde un gobierno regional. Por eso considero que es necesario y urgente que el gobierno de España se implique. The community of Madrid, not only the Spanish epicenter, but also the European and even global epicenter for a good part of the first wave, has once again become the region with the highest transmission rate for the coronavirus in the entire Western world at the beginning of the second wave. Madrid, with a recorded incidence of over 700 cases per 100,000 inhabitants in 14 days at the end of September, was already the worst source of infection in Europe for the second time in six months. And the question, the million dollar question is, what has regional president Isabel Diaz Ayuso and her government done to prepare for the second wave? After all, they've had plenty of time to do so, right? What contingency plan did the Madrid government prepare for its citizens as it watched the cases grow steadily in Catalonia during the month of June? Did they think that Madrid would be immune from a second wave and that they would not be hit again despite constant warnings from the medical and scientific community? In short, what were their priorities? Well, here's a taste. 4.5 million euros in grants in Madrid to support fighting bull livestock, ABC. Madrid subsidy to the electric bicycle, up to 600 euros if it is not a sports or high-end bike, El Confidencial. Okay. Now this might seem a little populist on our part, but that is the truth. These are just two of the many examples we could give of how the government of the community of Madrid has proven its lack of clarity about what its priorities should be. Sports centres, art purchases, new facilities for public employees, tax breaks. You only have to take a look at the Community of Madrid's press page to realise that something, something's not quite right. These are all things that were simply not a priority. But, of course, let's not kid ourselves, it's not surprising that they did all this because the regional president of Madrid herself, Isabel Diaz Ayuso, told the president of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, that she believed the pandemic was over. You don't believe me? Listen for yourself. Pero también nos hace falta estos recursos económicos, también lo habíamos hablado, porque gracias al primer fondo del gobierno, junto con los recursos de la Comunidad de Madrid, hemos podido hacer contrataciones extraordinarias, pero durante el 2021 vamos a seguir teniendo este problema. Pensamos que la pandemia iba a durar menos, pero sigue entre nosotros. So is it possible that that is the explanation for such a lack of control and such chaos? Is it possible that Spanish politicians are so disconnected from reality that they did not realise that the pandemic was not yet over? How can regional governments spend three months demanding that the central government give them back their powers in the area of public health and then do absolutely nothing? Todas las comunidades autónomas tienen a su disposición la herramienta legal del estado de alarma y la posibilidad de solicitar su declaración en todo o en parte de su territorio. Eso no. Be that as it may, the reality 
is what it is. And the reality is that since the end of the confinement and, in particular, since early September, when many Madrid residents returned from vacation, the Madrid subway has been overflowing with people. The carriages and the platforms were at full rush hour capacity and the safety distances could not be kept because the summer schedule with reduced frequency was kept well into September without anyone noticing. Someone was having a siesta at the wheel. <laughs> I did it again. Nor did the Madrid government ask the Ministry of Transport to put more trains on the metropolitan lines of Renfe's commuter rail system to avoid congestion. Nothing was done at all. Protocols and contingency plans were conspicuous by their absence. A disaster that has caused Madrid to have the highest rate of positive PCR tests in all of Europe and one of the highest rates in the developed world. In concrete terms, at the end of September, 20.7% of the more than 150,000 PCR tests that were being carried out in Madrid each week were coming back positive. We are talking about a contagion rate that's twice the national average and four times the limit by which the pandemic is considered to be out of control. A limit that the World Health Organization says is 5%. This means even if you do about 150,000 tests a week, more than 20% of the tests in Madrid are positive. During the months of September, the virus was running wild. So much so that even with so many tests, they were still inadequate. In order to control the pandemic in Madrid and adequately detect infections, it would be necessary to do about four times more tests, more than half a million a week. And not only would this be materially impossible given the available resources, but also what is actually happening is just the opposite. Even fewer tests are being collected. Check this out. Madrid will no longer test people in close contact with a positive case. New guideline in the region, El Español. My amigos, the management disaster that Spanish politicians have been leading does not end there. Yo lo que pido desde que soy presidente de la Comunidad de Madrid es una reunión con el presidente del gobierno. Necesitamos sentarnos y hablar porque la situación de la epidemia en la Comunidad de Madrid es eh, especial. Sí que creo que tiene que haber una estrategia nacional. Es decir, somos un motor económico, somos una España en España. Entonces no se puede comparar las cifras de Madrid con ninguna otra comunidad autónoma. Madrid está en una situación de serio riesgo sanitario. Yo quiero emplazar desde la máxima lealtad a la Comunidad Autónoma de Madrid a seguir las recomendaciones que les hicimos de extender las medidas de limitación de movilidad al conjunto de la ciudad de Madrid. Another example, if one is needed, of bad management is Radar COVID, an application launched by the Spanish government to report positive cases of coronavirus, which some autonomous communities such as Madrid and Catalonia had blocked. Why? How is it possible that the various administrations, both the government of Spain and the regional governments, did not dedicate all the necessary resources to set up equipment and teams for mass testing and tracing? They knew. I mean, they had to know that it was something important. Europe warned about it, the World Health Organization warned about it, and the experience of countries that have successfully confronted COVID-19 have proved it. Test, trace, and isolate. That was the key formula. However, if we have just seen with the case of Madrid, the truth is that practically no region took the end of the confinement very seriously. In fact, as early as July, just one month after the end of the de-escalation, outbreaks began to appear all over the country. You see, the outbreaks, that is, group infections of more than three cases with the same origin, quickly multiplied until they got so out of control in a municipality in Galicia and in the province of Leda in Catalonia, where apparently the cases spread rapidly due to cases imported from Africa by seasonal workers who went to work in the fields. In fact, one of the biggest mistakes of the autonomous governments was not to guarantee the health and safety of the seasonal workers, who, as in previous years, were housed in shared rooms of 10 or even more people without any safety distancing measures. These factors forced the confinement of an area in the region of Galicia and another in the province of Leda. However, while the Galicians managed to control their outbreak quickly, in Catalonia, the government of Queen Tora also failed, at least initially, to the point that the Leda outbreaks made the leap to the entire Barcelona metropolitan area. Area. And, of course, during the summer the virus found it very, very easy to make the jump to other regions such as Aragon, the Basque Country, Navarre and Madrid, where the situation eventually got totally 
out of control. There was neither sufficient testing nor widespread screening nor efficient contact tracing, nor even sufficiently strict social distancing measures. And to all of that, we have to add that the de-escalation was already very optimistic. The bars, the nightlife spots, and even some of the other popular festivals and public events were opened as soon as possible. So that allows us to say that the virus has the ideal breeding ground over the summer to gather all its pieces and put all of Spain back in checkmate. And as we have seen, that is precisely what happened. Another one of the tremendous fiascos during the de-escalation and the weeks that followed was the absolute lack of control in the Spanish ports and airports. The Spanish government, which is responsible for foreign health, refused to test international travellers for coronavirus, not even quick tests, and also refused to require a test at origin. Instead, they set up what they called a visual check, a farce by which public health officials could supposedly detect whether you had symptoms of coronavirus by looking at you? Yeah, yeah. With their Superman-like X-ray vision, they could see within you and see whether or not you were sick. Just listen to what the health minister himself said in mid-June. El control documental de este documento que tendrá que rellenar toda persona que venga a nuestro país, un control de temperatura mediante procedimientos automatizados y un control visual. Of course, it's hardly surprising that everything got out of control in Spain. While in other places the tracing teams worked and border controls were frequent and consistent, as for example in Italy, in Spain you can see that they were not. A sheet of paper, a visual check, and off you go. But what could possibly be behind such a lack of action? Amigos and amores, Tourism accounts for 13% of Spain's GDP and hundreds of thousands of jobs depend on it. So the government thought it best not to hinder the arrival of travellers. However, that strategy turned out to be a real disaster. A few weeks after the start of the tourist season, the cases began to rise and it was the countries of origin of the tourists themselves that began to discourage and even prevent their citizens from travelling to Spain or at least to its most affected areas. UK will establish a quarantine for all travelers coming from Spain, La Vanguardia. Switzerland joins the other 28 countries that impose a quarantine for travelers coming from Spain, RTVE. In other words, the Spanish government thought that by not putting measures in place, they would save the tourist season. But what happened was exactly the opposite. One tourist season lost, hundreds of thousands of jobs destroyed or at risk of disappearing, and the Spanish economy recording the largest drop in all of Europe. And to top it all off, the virus is at large again. Spanish economy plunges into recession. GDP falls 17.8% in the second quarter due to COVID-19. 20 minutos. Yeah. 17.8%. To give you an idea, this is a drop of almost 60%, more than the rest of Europe. And in the third quarter, things are continuing to be just as bad. The disastrous management of the pandemic is also causing a terrible economic situation that will see Spain recording the worst performances in all of Europe in 2020. The 4th of October 2020, Spain's toxic politics and health crisis have got Merkel worried. German officials view the situation in Spain with growing concern. The resurgence has exposed fractures in systems of government. Spain's economy has collapsed. Bloomberg. Now, let's take just one moment here. At this point, many of you are probably asking yourselves, how on earth can anyone with responsibility for governing and managing do such a shocking job? Who are the people responsible for this disaster? Well. Let's take a look. The real virus. You see, my visual poll amigos, if there is one thing that differentiates Spain from other countries in Europe, is that the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus pandemic is not the only one the country is facing. There is another that I am sorry to say runs rampant among the political class of the country. That of the extreme incompetence of the leaders and public officials. Okay, maybe you think I'm being just a little bit too harsh, but it's just that. Having made Spain the epicenter of the coronavirus in March and letting it happen again in September without any particular measures having been taken, well, I, I don't really know. You tell me, how do I explain that? Case in point, it was not until the end of September, seven months after the beginning of the pandemic, that the regional government of Madrid had the idea of installing and inaugurating 
with great pomp and ceremony, some mini sanitizer gel dispensers on the subway. And take note that the launching of the gel dispensers was attended by the vice president of the regional government himself, Ignacio Aguado. See my friends, when it comes to the crunch, Spanish politicians, at least many of them, don't really seem to know anything. Take for example what's happening with the schools. Spain is the only country in the world that has opened schools, institutes and universities with such a high rate of spread of the virus. Couldn't online education plans have been implemented temporarily as South Korea did for example? Does it make sense to risk a new uncontrolled spread that could close companies and businesses all because they couldn't postpone or better stagger the return to classes? Just two weeks after the return to classes, many problems had already occurred. Isabel Tsela, Minister of Education, confirms that there are 2,852 classrooms under quarantine due to coronavirus. Antena tres noticias. Chivite, president of the Navarre region, wrongly orders lockdown of healthy students in Navarre region while keeping coronavirus infected students in schools. El Español. A single positive in a classroom will not be a reason to quarantine students of primary, secondary, or baccalaureate education. La Opinión de Murcia. I mean, really, you couldn't prepare an online alternative for those months? It is clear that Spain is once again the worst country for the spread of the coronavirus. And no, it's not something that has anything to do with public spending, which is, by the way, among the highest in the developed world. For example, Spain has an armed force of 120,000 people. 120,000 people who could have been used to carry out tracing, case follow-ups, testing, monitoring, or the installation of provisional COVID testing centers to reduce the pressure on health centers. But no, by the fall, all that has been done is to train 2,000 military personnel to be tracers to help regions that request it. 2,000 tracers for the whole of Spain. Not to mention the thousands of administrative officials who have been sitting on their thumbs during these months. Yes, yes, sitting idly by while they continue to collect their pay from the government. Social Security closes its offices to the public, ABC. Obviously, this is not a question of resources, but above all, of agility. Meanwhile, in the face of such a serious situation with the worst numbers in the developed world and a second wave with the numbers of cases and deaths skyrocketing, the main person responsible for managing the pandemic is engaged in activities that we can only best describe as alternative? Fernando Simon, a Saturday practicing surfing in Portugal in the middle of the wave of coronavirus outbreaks, ABC. Fernando Simon caught diving in the sea of Mallorca with Jesus Cayela, C-O-P-E. The director of the Health Alert and Emergency Coordination Center, Fernando Simon, has been seen accompanied by the mountaineer Jesus Calleja, with whom he is recording a chapter of the TV show Planeta Calleja. I mean, having said that, I don't know. Does this seem normal to you? Because to me... It certainly doesn't. Of course, these are not the only awkward moments where it has been difficult to describe what Simon has been up to during the pandemic. Se han tomado una serie de medidas importantes de gran impacto social que tienen que ver con la probabilidad de transferencia de grandes grupos de población potencialmente. Perdón, fecha. I don't know. It might be funny if it were not for the fact that he's laughing and making jokes while contagion rates and the death toll just keeps growing. It's all a little bit perverse. Well, the fact is that it has been precisely the negligent actions of the authorities, both of the central government and of the regional governments, which led 20 Spanish public health experts and epidemiologists to request an external audit of the public management of the pandemic. <laughs> petition that was published in the prestigious scientific magazine The Lancet and was signed by important figures in the Spanish scientific community. In short, 
negligence, sloppiness, incompetence, I think you now have a pretty good understanding why Spain is once again the worst country in the developed world in both health and economic terms. It was in this position during the first wave and it is all set to do the same thing during the second. Why on earth haven't Spanish politicians taken a look at the countries that have faced the pandemic relatively successfully? Countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, or the Baltic countries, among many others. All they had to do was copy the best practices. Now, having said that, what can we expect in the near future? Well, Basically, we are faced with two options. That Spain is simply leading a trend and that, in the matter of weeks, the whole of Europe will end up in a similarly bad situation. Or that Spain will have a much worse start to the autumn winter wave than its neighbours. At the moment, it seems like the second possibility is the most likely. Here at Visual Politic, our crystal balls are all broken, and so we cannot predict which of these two things will happen. But what we can predict is that, with the current health data and the economic damage that is being produced, the Spanish people should reflect on this. In the great financial crisis of 2008, they were among the worst affected. In the 2015 debt crisis, they were at the back of the line. And now, in 2020, a pandemic is here and, once again, they are the worst hit. That is a crisis every four years in which Spain again and again fares the worst. I don't know about you, but it looks to me like the model is failing, doesn't it? And by the way, this is something that not only Spain's own citizens, but also those from all over Europe need to take note of. The European Union is rescuing these bungling policymakers with hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros, but they're only making things worse and worse. Does that make sense? Shouldn't the EU authorities take action? Leave your opinion in the comments below. So, we really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media Podcast too. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not my dulcet tones. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And, as always, I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.